Okay, good morning. Today we're going to uh, talk about purification, functionalization, and separation of nanostructures. Really an overview of approaches to uh, taking nanostructures as they're synthesized and uh, doing further processing on them uh, as uh, often preparation to then subsequent processing that ends up uh, with their use in an application. For example, making a solution of, of nanotubes or nanoparticles uh, removing impurities, uh, uh, further separating their size, and perhaps depositing them on a substrate uh, for use in a thin film electronic device or dispersing them in a polymer, for example, for preparation of a structural composite. Uh, so first, uh, the announcements. Uh, you should be aware that your project proposals are due no later than Friday. And I'd like you to uh, give me a printed copy uh, so I can make comments directly on the printed copy, as well as register uh, your topic and, and so on at this uh, website, which is a Google spreadsheet. And that leads to uh, my uh, change in, in plans. And I apologize for this being late. Uh, uh, but uh, I think it's a better idea to have peer review on the project proposals rather than the videos. And, and this is uh, you know, for two reasons. One, I want to have a component of the grade of the course to be related to participation. Uh, and, 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 but you know, more so, it's for benefit of one another. I expect everyone does all of this, and it's pass-fail. And, uh, and that just becomes 5 out of 5%. Uh, so in that sense, it doesn't really affect the grade distribution. But I think it's an important thing to do. So uh, this is going to be due on Friday, April 2, one week from Friday. But please do it as soon as possible for benefit of your classmates. Uh, I'm going to post a review sheet for you and an updated project description uh, that will describe the further details. Uh, but uh, like I was asking you to review five videos, I will ask you individually to review five proposals. So that means each of you will do five reviews, and each of you will receive five reviews. So you're going to uh, have to sign up on this spreadsheet uh, with your proposal, a link to where your classmates can download the file, uh, as well as uh, a, a, you're going to have to sign up for the proposals you are going to review, uh, because then we get five for everyone. Uh, and uh, you know, this is worth 2.5% of your grade. The other 2.5% of the 5% participation will be on peer review of uh, the abstracts for your project reports, as described in the, uh, in, in the uh, project description. Uh, and if you're late uh, in submitting the review to your classmates, then you won't get any credit. And, but if you submit the reviews and the reviews are satisfactory, then you get full credit. And I'm, other than hearing from you, if you don't receive reviews, uh, I'm not going to look at the reviews there for your own benefit. I'm going to focus on reviewing your proposals and providing my comments. And hopefully with my comments plus your classmates' comments, your proposals and your eventual projects can be better. And, and, and based on availability, you can choose to review whatever proposals you want. And you can review the proposals of the people who you're in a prospective team with. So teams of three, you can review your other two prospective teammates and three other people. However, I ask you to please, uh, even though you might be talking closely with, with your teammates, to, to fill out this form and try to do it a bit more formally rather than just kind of talk about things. Uh, one, you know, it's actually been proven by research on peer review that it's better to take like your, your, someone else's proposal or someone else's idea and take it away and look at it independently on your own rather than, uh, and then discuss it with someone rather than uh, just talk about things. Uh, also kind of works that way when journal papers and proposals are sent out review for review. So that'll uh, come out later today. And then there is one more problem set. And I realize that uh, you know, time is getting late, and there's a lot to do for the project. Uh, but I still want to have it. It will be brief. It will be a team assignment. So you'll only be required to submit one per team. And that'll be due April 12. And I'll, I'll plan to release it around about uh, next Friday or the following Monday. Of course, it'll cover the topics that we're starting to address uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks. And uh, the project is half of the grade. So there's a lot of grade left. Uh, and there's also a lot to do. So a few of my suggestions uh, as you get your proposals together, you know, start now, make a schedule for your team. Don't get hung up on ideas. Uh, come to me and ask questions if you're unsure of a specific direction. And also, you know, uh, divide and conquer. So you know, break up the problem, the tasks that are required for the, for the report and for the presentation, and do it in parallel. And then uh, I'm going to endeavor to review all of your proposals by next Monday and schedule meetings with each of your teams late next week. I'll probably only have 15 minutes to talk to each team, but I'll try to set that up and let you know about that. Uh, so uh, I'm going to you know, prioritize reviewing the proposals. That means I probably won't get to grading the exam until uh, later next week. But I want to get uh, my comments on your ideas back to you as soon as possible.
So we're, uh, since we've passed the exam question, uh, I have five criteria, and I'll be grading those hopefully this weekend as well. Uh, and I'll give you a comment sheet uh, to each of your teams. So uh, we're really entering the final stretch of the class where we're going to take our knowledge on properties, interactions, and synthesis and try to put it together and think about assembly and think about applications, and applications through examples and applications through your projects. And in these topics listed at the end, we have seven lectures to go. So today we're going to talk about functionalization and separation, and we're going to end up with a picture of nanostructures in some isolated and refined form, where they've been made by largely the bulk processes or substrate-bound processes we discussed in the past few lectures. And now we can think about what do we do with them and how do we combine them and place them uh, to uh, take advantage of their properties. So then. After today, in the next three weeks and six lectures, we'll start on a journey talking about assembly and how assembly relates to larger scale properties. We'll address self-assembly in solution, formation of controlled aggregates, of what are called micelles, and there's an energetic formulation for understanding the formation of these micelles. And then we will talk about self-assembly on substrates, particularly in terms of forming monolayers of molecules and forming assemblies in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion, basically adding up layers of nanostructures one after the other and using that to achieve some new materials. And then we'll talk about self-assembly or the ability to use interactions, a lot of the interactions we know about already, van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces, as well as external fields things such as electric fields and magnetic fields to put nanostructures together in a more ordered fashion. And some of these things we've already you know, implied in terms of aggregation or stability, and some of these interactions will also be implied when we talk about assembly of layers. But here we'll really try to focus on understanding how to balance the interactions a bit more and how that's being used to achieve very highly ordered assemblies, things like very well-packed lattices that can try to achieve this dream of perfect positioning and orientation. And one of the examples of this is what we saw before in terms of top-down uh, or, or, or templated self-assembly where you take a top-down method such as lithography and combine that with a self-assembly approach, for example, to precisely place particles in trenches. And then in the final two lectures, I'll talk about uh, how to hook nanostructures together and how that relates to properties of networks, for example, electrical properties of films and uh, thermal and mechanical properties. And I wish we had more time to talk about uh, things like structural composites and other means of assembly using bi biological interactions, but it's unfortunately something we won't get, get to in the lectures, but I think it will be expressed in some of your projects. So that'll be a way we'll be able to learn from each other on that. And I should be able to post a little bit of extra material that I have uh, from, from, from different emphases in past years uh, in that regard. And then we'll have the uh, final report and presentations on Monday evening, April 19th. And then for those of you on the GCC, that's coming up at the end. So I want to start today's lecture by thinking what happens after we make nanostructures in bulk. We have this picture now of nucleation and growth in a liquid or in a gas phase or on a substrate. And no matter where and how you make the structures, there are often some extra steps that need to happen before you end up with their final use in, uh, ap in an application. So I've categorized these next steps in three areas. And the first is the general process of purification. Uh, often uh, you may want to remove Im impurities from the materials, such as uh, undesired byproducts or unreacted catalyst. Uh, for example, in growth of carbon nanotubes, in some cases you may want to remove the catalyst from the substrate or the catalyst from the nanotubes, and perhaps also remove amorphous carbon from the sidewalls of the nanotubes, because that can affect the transport through the nanotubes and often forms because in the hydrocarbon atmosphere that grows the nanotubes, there's a lot of gas phase decomposition and deposition on the surfaces of the tubes. You may also, you know, another means of purification is to anneal the material, and one way that can help is it can improve the crystal structure. So we'll see an example of that later on. It also, for example, if you have impurities that have a different thermal decomposition temperature than your desired material, that can improve uh, the purity of the structure as well. Uh, amorphous carbon and carbon nanotubes is another example of that because less crystalline carbon is going to degrade at a lower temperature than the nanotubes so you can remove surface impurities by thermal annealing. 
And another means of purification that I've categorized is, is etching. And you know, etching, if it's selective to impurities or byproducts, can purify in that way. But also you may want to etch the material to control its size. And just as you can etch thin films and wafers in microfabrication, you can use a lot of the same chemicals to etch nanostructures with some specifics and maybe better control of selectivity and the etch rate because you're etching really small things and therefore uh, if you etch for too long, they're more likely to go away. <clears throat> and then the next category of uh, sort of post-processing is the general process of stabilization and functionalization. And this involves a lot of chemistry, which we won't get into and is often very specific to the type of structures you're dealing with. But the general process picture I want us to, to discuss is the ability to associate other molecules to the surfaces of nanostructures and use that to facilitate material interactions with other things. So what I mean by that is say you start out with a powder of carbon nanotubes that's all entangled and has some impurities in it and say you want to separate it based on its chirality. Well, to separate it based on its chirality, you need to isolate the nanotubes individually so you can then use a separation method discussed later to uh, pick out one chirality versus another. That's a, indeed a really challenging problem uh, to which we'll see a recent solution. Uh, but to do that, you need to break up that powder and you need to stabilize the nanotubes using you know, perhaps this basic idea of having electrostatic interactions keep them apart in a solution. And then you can work with the nanotubes in solution and execute that separation process. And you know, functionalization can be applied to flat surfaces and virtually all types of solids based on an understanding of how to attach chemically and or physically, just based on van der Waals interactions, other molecules to the surfaces. And then the third topic is separation and sorting. And in this case, uh, you just want to partition whatever you have, our general, uh, you know, group of nanostructures has a distribution of sizes and also may have a distribution of shapes and also may have a distribution of electronic structures, for example, metallic and semiconducting carbon nanotubes. So there are a bunch of general methods to separate things out by, uh, by based on these characteristics. And I put this last because it's often easier to separate the structures if they're as pure as possible and if they are separated or if they are stabilized in solution, meaning they're isolated. It's harder to say, you know, separate a powder where things might be physically tangled together. And I think, you know, this today's topic may leave us with a lot that we still want to learn, uh, uh, but we'll have to leave it here. And I just want us to see what happens in each of these steps. And uh, as I just said, I think I, I, I jumped ahead and said that, you know, this order is generally interchangeable, but you want to have the structures isolated and pure before you separate them. And you can use functionalization, as we'll see, to uh, you know, disperse the structures, to spread them out in solution, and also interface them to one another or to other materials. So if you can uh, develop means to attach other molecules to structures or attach structures to one another, you can diversify the types of assembly and interactions that you can create. And this is really intimately related to how the properties scale up. Because if you consider any micro scale material and beyond, you're going to do a lot of structures in it. And, 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 and the way in which those structures interact with one another or interact with the host material is very important. That can span from, say, electrical transport through the structures where the properties of the junctions between them is important, all the way to mechanical transport where that junction is maybe the interface between uh, the nanowire or nanotube and say a polymer or an epoxy and the strength of that bond, the ability to transfer load or to absorb energy upon deformation is very important to the properties of the composite. <clears throat> So I've posted three uh, papers for reading, and I chose these uh, uh, because they talk about a bit of the uh, physics of each of these processes, but provide examples of you know, separation by filtration, uh, sorting by density gradient centrifugation, and also sorting by electrophoresis. So there are three different methods which give examples of how nanostructures are processed to uh, separate them by size uh, or by electronic structure. And then, you know, I, I would call these more so reference papers rather than extra readings. I just have a few other papers I like. One is on, uh, just talks more specifically about functionalization of single-walled carbon nanotubes. 
Another one talks about shape separation of nanorods by centrifugation and, and, and basically the idea that the mobility of a nanoparticle in solution can depend on its shape, all because of a force balance. And then I have a last paper which is uh, actually from the world of microfabrication and it talks about etch rates for different materials. This is just a really good reference if you're doing microfabrication or if you're looking at different chemistries that might etch different materials. They did a whole bunch of experiments and collected a lot of data. So let's start and, and, and return to our picture from uh, synthesis uh, where we realize that you know, lab scale processes to grow nanotubes can be small, but industrial scale processes can be very large. And in fact, over 300 tons of carbon nanotubes as an example material are made around the world each year, largely for use in polymer composites and batteries. A lot of our cell phone and laptop batteries have nanotubes in the electrodes because they improve the charge discharge cycling of the electrodes. Uh, and, and also for uh, conductive plastics. But a process like this, which is a big rotary tube furnace and generally passes catalyst powder uh, from one side to the other, uh, you know, it, it is not generally growing films on wafers, but is growing powders. So you end up with a large uh, clump of carbon nanotubes, which is generally entangled and has a fairly low density. Incidentally, the, the, the packing of the nanotubes is so loose in this case that this guy holding a big bag at, uh, at, at, at Nanocarbon Technologies in Japan uh, only has 100 grams of nanotubes in it. But uh, this bag of nanotubes, in fact, was purified and treated after it came out of the growth furnace. And in fact, what this company does is they have a multi-step sequence to make the nanotubes and then uh, purify them and then mix them into polymers and then they actually sell a product which they call a master batch which consists of nanotubes and polymers mixed together. And uh, what they do after the growth process is they anneal the nanotubes at very high temperature to do two things. One, to remove the catalyst, uh, which uh, if you have an application in structural composites and you have iron which has no mechanical function, it'll add extra weight. Uh, in other applications, it can also be uh, chemically uh, not a good thing. And another thing the annealing process does is it uh, heals defects in the nanotubes and improves their structural quality. So here's a picture of uh, a nanotube that comes out of their CVD process, uh, out of the CVD furnace, and after they pass it through their annealing furnace, which at a temperature, I think, uh, over 2000 C, causes uh, just by thermal energy and, and, and relaxation and reorganization of the bonds causes a dramatic change in the structural quality of the tubes. And you could see this uh, by looking at the thermal decomposition temperature difference. You could see it in diffraction. You could see it in Raman spectroscopy. But it's clear here that the organization of the walls is much better in the latter case than in the first case. So even if the CVD process may inherently produce structures that are quite defective, it's possible in the simple case to scalably treat the material to uh, reach a better state. And, and these tubes are, are quite structurally good, uh, I would say, in terms of producing multi-walled tubes in large quantities. This large-scale process is pretty much a solved problem. Uh, and, and incidentally, uh, in this annealing process, they also remove the catalyst by evaporation. Uh, because, the, uh, because the melting temperature of iron is way below the melting temperature of carbon uh, and also helped a bit by the nanoscale size melting effect, they heat this powder which contains nanotubes and iron and the iron goes away and they're able to produce uh, pretty much 100% you know, high quality nanotubes with very few impurities. Incidentally, you still see on the sidewall here, there's a bit of, uh, a bit of extra material, uh, generally broken walls and what would be called amorphous carbon, but the final result is quite high purity. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, if, if we wanted to think that's one method of purification, and I said it first because it, to me it's the really simplest and most scalable one, just requiring heat and uh, causing a dramatic and important transformation in the structures, and that's just one example. But another and you could say more widespread way that nanostructures are purified is by the general process of chemical etching. And uh, this is largely similar to uh, etching materials in microfabrication. For example, uh, patterning a photoresist and using the photoresist as a mask to etch an oxide layer or a metal layer underneath, whether it by using a wet chemical method or a dry method such as a plasma. And, uh, but you know, let me say that in these cases, you might need to be more aware of 
geometry dependent and crystal sensitive etch rates. For example, some uh, chemicals and some materials etch in different, uh, you know, different rates in different crystal directions, and that perhaps is more important in the case of etching nanostructures. And there are also some differences that are driven by the electronic structure of the material, in that uh, you know, size can affect the electronic structure of things like quantum dots and nanotubes. Uh, etching is a chemical process, and chemistry requires transfer of electrons. And in some cases, that can be problematic. In other cases, it can be quite useful and used to advantage. For example, in ways of designing chemistries to selectively etch semiconducting nanotubes versus metallic nanotubes. And although we won't discuss an example of that, there's been a lot of recent research on that topic. And uh, also, uh, you know, their etching depends on the perfection of the material, and etching can be faster at defect sites. For example, if you have a flaw in a structure, that's kind of a weak point for the etchant to attack it. You know, poke it and kind of tear it apart. And that can be used to etch structures effectively, but can also be really important because you can undesirably break a structure at a point where you may not, may, may not want to break it uh, uh, in the process of, say, trying to etch it slowly to decrease its diameter or to decrease its length. So uh, that's, those are all kind of general points. And I'll take another specific example from uh, processing of carbon nanotubes after growth. Uh, and uh, this approach uses uh, a mixture of acids, in this case nitric acid and sulfuric acid, to uh, purify nanotubes by removing the catalyst and removing amorphous carbon. So this mixture of acids will etch the iron nanoparticles or nickel nanoparticles in some cases. Uh, there, there are different acids that etch different metals uh, that reside with the nanotube powder and will also more quickly attack amorphous carbon, the nanotube carbon, because the amorphous carbon has more defects and more edges. And what this study did is it uh, looked at the kinetics of etching nanotubes in solution and uh, addressed a very important point that if you have this tangled powder of nanotubes as an example of nanostructures, uh, it, uh, it, it, it has a lot, you know, all the tubes kind of hooked together in this tangled mess, and the chemi chemistry can do what you want and also can do some other things. And specifically, if you look, if the goal of this process is to you know, remove the amorphous carbon and take away the catalyst, uh, the etchant also attacks the nanotubes at defects. And uh, if they observe the average length of the nanotubes versus the time of etching, it's called the oxidation time because uh, you know, what the, what the uh, etchant is doing is trying to essentially uh, uh, dissolve the amorphous carbon by oxidation, you see a very extreme relationship where the uh, nanotubes are cut by the etchant. And in a very short time at the initial stages of the etching process, the length goes down. And so what's happening here is if you think that uh, you have a uh, nanotube that has a bunch of defects on it, uh, you know, imagine that there's some average number of defects per unit length. I'll draw the nanotube here and say there are defects all along its length. Then there's a, you know, an equal chance for any of the defect sites to be attacked by the etchant and maybe an equal chance for it to be cut if, that, if it's enough of a defect for it to be sliced. And you end up slicing it into smaller and smaller segments. And then if those smaller segments have defects in them still, then they get sliced as well. And that's kind of an exponential decay in the length of the structures. You know, uh, the physics beyond this aren't important for us, but this is a very important trend that can indeed happen. And another uh, uh, you know, practical impact of a process like this is that you also can degrade the quality of the material undesirably if you etch it for uh, too long of a duration. And this is showing a Raman spectrum of the uh, nanotubes as a function of the oxidation time. And uh, you can, in fact, see that there's a trade-off between uh, the etching time and the final quality of the material. And here, the quality can be related to the ratio of this uh, G-band peak, which responds to the graphitic structure in the nanotubes, and this D-band peak that responds to defects in the structure. And you can see that because this etching process is cutting the nanotubes into segments, it's leaving more cut ends and actually, in, in an aggregate sense, making the nanotubes themselves more defective. And this ratio increases as time goes on, indicating that you're, in fact, uh, you know, cutting the material up 
and making it uh, structurally of lower quality, even though you may be removing amorphous content and catalyst from the system. Bailey at two hours. This one, I'm actually not sure. I have to look at the paper. Uh, but, uh, but they do talk of the general trend of it increasing. Uh, I don't think it's some complex kinetic. It may just be some outlier in their data. But you know, nonetheless, even though this, you know, the, the nanotubes get cut up, they're able to, you can compare these two TEM images from uh, before the process and after the process, where uh, if you look at this picture kind of being cloudier and having more you know, catalysts, the dark spots and impurities, uh, you make the nanotubes a lot cleaner, uh, even though they are indeed shorter segments. And it's, it's hard to assess the length from this image, uh, but they did that by dispersing the tubes at low concentration and looking at their average length uh, using an SEM. <clears throat> So another type of etching that can be used is instead of a wet etch, you can use a dry etch. And a dry etch is just chemistry that happens in the gas phase. And often uh, dry etches are assisted using a plasma or by using a voltage to ionize the etching gas to then execute a reaction, whether it be uh, chemical or physical, to uh, remove some of the material that you want. And one example of this, again, with nanotubes is taking a uh, a forest of vertically aligned nanotubes. These are, in fact, fairly uh, large diameter nanotubes with a lot of walls. And using a plasma, uh, in this case, it's an oxygen plasma, uh, because the oxygen plasma will uh, etch the carbon by oxidation. And using that to take just a little bit off the top of the nanotubes to uh, open their caps. So you know, a lot of schematics of nanotubes you see you know, don't really show the caps. But indeed, whenever you grow a nanotube, as we discussed, uh, if, particularly if it's by base growth, the cap lifts off the catalyst at the beginning, and it has a cap like this, like uh, Alex Zettel from Berkeley is showing with his, with his little model. And for applications such as electronic devices, or say you wanted to now uh, use this as an interface material and kind of plug into all the nanotubes from the top uh, to take advantage of their properties in parallel, the contact resistance to the nanotubes would be a lot lower if you indeed etched the caps off. So what this process is doing is by exposing the forest to an etching atmosphere, uh, it, uh, like, it eats away the top surface of the tubes because those tubes are more exposed, because the ones at the bottom are less exposed to the etchant. They're gonna, not going to be degraded as much. Plus, also, because the uh, cap is less stable, there's more strain in that cap, it's more likely to be attacked by the etching chemistry. And they confirm this uh, by showing a nanotube that they removed from the forest and indeed had uh, an open end. And you can see the walls kind of roughly terminated like so. Uh, and, and we can also see the dramatic difference uh, like here. And in fact, this was done by a, by, by a tip growth. And uh, they, after the uh, plasma etching was done, they had some catalyst remaining in the system. And they also, did it, uh, they also washed it in hydrochloric acid a chemical etch to remove any extra catalyst. So by combining this kind of gas phase etch and a gentle chemical etch, they were able to produce this picture on the right. <clears throat> so in general, using you know, different etchants, you can uh, etch nanostructures in different ways, or you can uh, etch materials that may surround the nanostructures. So we mentioned before the uh, concept of uh, producing uh, aligned nanostructures in templates. And we saw the one example of using a porous template to kind of electrodeposit metal and then grow nanotubes in it. And as a general example here, the photos from this paper are showing the case of using a gas phase etching process of plasma, uh, in this case an oxygen plasma, to remove a polymer membrane in which they grew uh, gold nanowires, I believe by electrodeposition uh, into the pores. And we're just seeing here uh, snapshots of the process of the etching process at different times, uh, where this etchant will selectively etch the polymer away and then will reveal the nanowires from beneath it. So this is just one example to dissolve a template in which you may initially confine the growth of nanowires or nanotubes. And generally, uh, if you design the chemistry so it's selective to the polymer, and not to the metal, it's easier to etch polymers because they contain organics rather than metals, which generally require aggre more aggressive uh, acid chemistries. You can uh, remove uh, one structure from a matrix in which it may be grown. 
And there are lots of examples of things like this, but this kind of concept, as you can see, is a way that you might uh, post-process a film of structures that's grown and reveal the, the structures for you know, now maybe uh, using them as a contact as well or as an, as, as an emission surface or uh, as for some you know, biointerfacing or sensing application, perhaps taking advantage of the plasmon resonance of these gold nanowires. <coughs> so as a general overview of techniques of etching, uh, you can consider there are wet chemistries to etch materials, there are dry chemistries to etch materials. Uh, you, know, you can think of what chemistries will etch organics. Uh, nanotubes are an example of an organic, a carbon, or a nitrogen containing molecule. Semiconductors, silicon nanowires, quantum dots, oxides and metals, things like gold nanowires we saw on the previous slide. And in general, the you know, considerations that you might have for etching larger things are going to be important at the nanoscale as well. Uh, the etch rate, uh, the selectivity, uh, for example, the rate at which you etch that, the, that polymer membrane versus the rate at which you etch the nanowires, as well as compatibility with other materials in the process. There might be other metal layers you have underneath the structures that you may not want to remove, but you may want to selectively process some of the others. And then also, uh, something that you know, tends to be particularly important in the case of small structures is if you're using a wet etch, how you dry the, the, the material. I don't have an example here, but uh, we know that the strength of capillary forces gets higher as size gets lower, uh, gets smaller, and for things like releasing things like thin films and MEMS, uh, a stiction uh, because of capillary forces drawing structures together is a very important problem. Uh, at the nanoscale, if you think of etching a forest of nanotubes in a wet solution, the nanotubes are going to aggregate together uh, due to the capillary forces as the, as the drying process occurs. So there are other techniques such as critical point drying, which is also used in MEMS, which are useful for, for example, stay, uh, preventing undesired aggregation of structures as you dry them. Same thing is true if you, say, are doing a bulk process uh, where you're processing you know, nanoparticles. If you dry it out, they may aggregate together, and you may need to physically redisperse them. You might instead terminate the etch by washing it with another solution and keeping them, keeping them in a dispersion rather than drying out the powder. And these are just for reference some uh, snapshots from the Williams paper, which is up for the reference, and goes through various types of etchants, for example, mixtures of acids and gas and, and, and mixtures of gases for etching particular materials, you know, such as silicon, uh, silicon oxide, metals, and down the chart. And uh, you could say, for example, you know, same, the same materials that would etch uh, silicon wafers would also etch silicon nanowires, but there are particular specific considerations to you know, the rate of the etch. For example, if you're etching nanowires, you may want to dilute the etchant a lot, so you really reduce the etch rate compared to a bulk case where you may want to eat through microns of material at a time on a silicon wafer. <coughs> So uh, the next uh, and second major topic I'll address is uh, the process of taking things like that you know, big bag of purified nanotubes the guy was holding and doing some chemistry on them to put them in solution. Uh, and uh, by you know, general definition of, of chemistry uh, of solutions, uh, you might hear the term dispersion and you might hear the term solution. And for us, the difference isn't going to be so critical, but you know, formally, uh, a dispersion is something that doesn't form spontaneously when you put something in solution and basically requires energy to separate it out and then requires, say, more energy to be applied versus time to keep it from aggregating back. And a solution is a, um, a, a, a liquid uh, that's stable over time and, say, forms spontaneously when you bring two components together. For example, if you take salt and you put a bit of salt in water, as long as it's not, you know, uh, super saturated, the salt is going to be dissolved uniformly and that's going to stay over time no matter how long you wait. Is there a question? Fit in to these uh, definitions. Well, I guess in, in this sense, uh, you say a colloid is, is a dispersion, but if a colloid is stable over time, then you might call it a colloidal solution. So there, you know, it's just a kind of issue of semantics. Uh, and in general, the stability of the, the, the solution over time is the primary consideration. <clears throat> so I'll take another example from you know, nanotubes here. Uh, and this is the process, a basic process for dispersing carbon nanotube powders in water. And nanotubes are generally hydrophobic, 
So uh, because A, they're physically aggregated if you make them in a powder, and B, because uh, they don't like water so much, you're not going to be able to drop a nanotube powder in water and have it form a solution. You're just going to retain aggregates uh, that uh, aren't going to be dispersed so well. So a typical means of dispersing a nanotube powder in water is to take the nanotubes, uh, drop them into water, and add a molecule, typically generally called a surfactant, a surfactant because it associates itself with the surface of the nanotubes, and then apply energy by sonication, and then reach a dispersion of the nanotubes, which is metastable uh, in water. So uh, this, you know, you can see a definite change in the optical properties here from the, uh, the, these nanotubes spreading out uh, in the solution and being stabilized by the surfactant molecules that come uh, so become associated with the surface. So uh, in general, a typical solution for doing this process is what's called SDS or sodium dodecyl sulfate. Uh, it's just a molecule that particularly works well in dispersing the nanotubes in water. Uh, an important point is that generally sonication is also an energetic process and can cut the nanotubes into pieces as well. So you don't want to apply too much energy uh, to the process because that, just like the acid etchant, can degrade the quality of your material. But in addition to the chemical or physical association of the surfactant, you need to provide some mechanical energy to break the associations between the nanotubes and stabilize them in solution. So the general process uh, implied by the previous slide is to take a powder of nanotubes, to mix it with the solution and the surfactant, and then to end up with a, uh, a, a solution that has the surfactant and the nanotubes generally mixed together. But uh, uh, you know, a prime problem, typically or a prime issue uh, with you know, nanotube products and also other structures that tend to aggregate is that you have bundles or aggregates that require energy to, 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 to break them apart. And these aren't chemically bonded together, but they're physically held together by van der Waals forces. So even though the surfactant molecule, if it's, uh, if, it, if it's near a nanotube surface, will like to associate itself and help disperse the nanotube in water, if the nanotubes are bundled together like so, the, the surfactant does not find its way in unless you're providing some energy to kind of shake the nanotubes up and spread them out. So that's what the sonication process does. And by sonication, you know, implied by the lightning bolt here, you end up physically agitating the nanotubes so the surfactant can take over and associate itself and can separate the tubes out in the final stage. This is, you know, a pretty ideal picture. Uh, and their nanotubes are all not individually isolated, but the general case is true that over time you break up these aggregates both in size laterally and in their length, and you end up with a more uniformly dispersed material than you started with. And then another thing that could be done uh, after the nanotubes are dispersed is then you could mix them with another material, such as a polymer, that might also be stabilized by this surfactant and then uh, end up with a mixture of nanotubes and polymer particles, which could then be used to make a polymer composite film. So here's, in fact, a, a, a composite of about 1%. I guess this is uh, 0.75, only 0.75 weight percent of multi-wall nanotubes dispersed in the polystyrene. Uh, uh, and that's a film that was made just by this simple process. So, and one way you apply this ultrasonic energy is to use uh, a sonicator, an ultrasonic bath. And you can have, you can have ultrasonic baths uh, which have a sonicator under the bath. Or if you want to apply, apply a higher uh, intensity and often a, a higher frequency, you use what's called a horn sonicator. And this is a probe like so, which gets buzzed at high frequency and applies the energy to the solution. And uh, one important thing uh, that we see again here is that you want to apply enough energy to the system, like you wanted to apply enough etching to the system to uh, get the desired result, but you don't want to apply too much, so you're just breaking it up into pieces and degrading its quality. And this also applies in this process of dispersion uh, by ultrasonics. And one way that these researchers in the Netherlands uh, monitored this dispersion process is they tried to relate the optical spectrum of the material to the amount of energy they were applying by sonication. So if you're applying a certain power uh, to the sonicator, to the solution, then you know, the power multiplied by the time is the energy. 
and here they've measured in, it in joules. And as you can imagine that uh, as the nanotubes are dispersed, you go from having a solution that's clear with a bunch of little black clumps in it to a solution that's uniformly dark. So its optical absorbance shown on the plot here on the y-axis increases versus time. And it's a spectrum versus, versus, versus wavelength. And you see here that as you apply more energy to the process, the absorbance of the, absorbance of the solution increases. And so you might ask, well, how do I know when I've done as much as I can do? Well, that's when the absorbance saturates versus time, or when I've, you know, I'm not, no longer changing the optical properties, no longer making it darker. So if I'm operating in this region uh, of, say, applying more than, say, 3,000 to 5,000 joules, I'm probably not getting any more benefit from trying to sonicate the nanotubes to disperse them more, and likely I'm just shaking them up and perhaps breaking them into pieces and creating more defects. So this was a pretty, you know, uh, elegant yet straightforward way to monitor, excuse me, the, the, uh, the dispersion of nanotubes in solution and relate it just to the amount of light absorbed. And uh, if we take off a picture from uh, the, from the real process that made the film that's being passed around. Uh, this is a TEM picture uh, where they've taken uh, some of the solution of the nanotubes that are dispersed with and then mixed with these stabilized polymer particles. So they, in fact, use polystyrene nanoparticles, uh, which you can purchase. And you can see here that the nanotubes are fairly long and also fairly well dispersed. They're, you know, this is kind of a small bundle, and these look to be isolated and so on. So this is a pretty good dispersion. And then after having that solution, the solution was freeze-dried to remove all the liquid. And now you can just see this is an SEM, so you get a different picture of how by this dispersion and mixing process and then drying, you formed a fairly well-dispersed network of the polymer and the nanotubes together. And then uh, the, the mixture was molded, so just by heat and pressure uh, at 100 C, trying to uh, get the materials to truly mix and to compact it so you remove the air. And then after you end up with this film, that uh, the, the one that's being passed around, that uh, has a fairly good mixture of nanotubes with polymers. And this was incidentally sought to uh, study the dispersion process and also to create polymers that are electrically conducting. And if this dispersion process uh, preserves the quality of the nanotubes and the length of the nanotubes, uh, the hope is to form a very efficient electrically conducting network. So be able to create a polymer with high electrical conductivity caused by the nanotubes by having a minimum quantity of nanotubes. And if the nanotubes have better quality and they're longer, by understanding and controlling this dispersion and mixing process, you would have uh, an eventual a better polymer composite that can more efficiently use nanotubes as a conductive additive. And we'll take off from this example in a few lectures when we talk about the scaling of network properties. And we'll see generally how conductive this material is and how the conductivity scales with the nanotube characteristics. And the, this picture accompanied the, the, the paper, uh, which kind of just generally said that in the end up, you end up with something like a cookie, where you can say, well, the chocolate chips in this cookie are the dispersed phase, and the polymer is the continuous phase. And you know, when you make a chocolate chip cookie, you don't want to have like all the cookies uh, with no chocolate chips except one that has all the chocolate chips. So you don't want to have, like, unless you like you know, chocolate-filled cookie, you don't want all the chocolate in the center. You want it to be pretty uniform. So it's just kind of like managing this, you know, the, the, the mixing and baking process only on a different scale. With, uh, with different materials. <clears throat> so this leads us to the, to the next topic of functionalization. And uh, in, you know, semantically, the process that we just described of taking these surfactant molecules and uh, introducing them to the nanotubes and, and, and associating with the nanotubes so they uh, stick to the sides and perhaps wrap them is one type of functionalization where the, the, the surfactant associates itself with the nanotube surface due to van der Waals or, or electrostatic interactions, but doesn't bond to the nanotubes, in fact. But there are other approaches which can use solution chemistry to actually make, make chemical bonds to the surfaces, and that's another type of functionalization. Another means of functionalization by, uh, by, uh, by terminology is just stabilizing the, uh, the structures with 
ionic charge or with electrostatic charge by attaching charged molecules and so on. So, you know, by definition, we say that a functional group is a specific group of atoms within a molecule that is responsible for chemical reactions involving that molecule. So if we have you know, functionalized nanotubes, we have some molecules on the surface uh, attached by any of these methods. And there's a particular group on that molecule that we might use for doing some later chemistry, whether it be physically interacting it with another structure, with a polymer, or chemically bonding the nanostructure to another thing. So the idea here is also that you can take your starting structure, you can associate another molecule with it uh, by chemical or physical methods, and then you can use that molecule as kind of like a linker to hook it to something else. And that can apply to carbon nanotubes or to nanoparticles or nanowires by understanding the solution chemistry and the surface chemistry of the structures. <clears throat> so now if we look at uh, our uh, nanotube example again, uh, we realize that you know, because nanotubes are you know, rarely perfect and they have a lot of defects, often uh, the attachment of functional groups in solution chemistry happens by uh, bonding at the sites of defects. It takes a different chemistry and a lot more energy to, uh, for the functional group to break a bond and for it to, to attach itself on the native lattice, although it's certainly possible, than for it to uh, attach at a place where maybe there's a missing atom or there is a 5775 pair, which would be energetically less stable, or for example, at a kink in the nanotube or at an end. If you had a process that opened the ends of the nanotubes by chemical etching, then you're not going to have just straight dangling carbon bonds. You're incidentally going to have something else hooked to the surface. So indeed, the processes that open the ends of nanotubes by uh, plasma etching end up with nanotubes that are functionalized by uh, carboxylic acid groups because those form in a native oxidizing ambient and stabilize the ends of the tubes. And you can have, you know, you, by different methods, you can functionalize nanotubes with different molecules. You know, the COOH, like the top, indicates, for example, a carboxylic acid. Uh, which, because the OH group has a negative charge, is often used to electrostatically stabilize nanotubes. And the R just indicates generally an alkyl group, which can have a diverse set of chemistries that you can do other things with. But uh, let's, let's just learn from this slide that, uh, you know, depending on really the atomic scale nature of the structure you're working with, that can determine where the molecules actually attach and what chemistries or energies are required to put the molecules there. And this is just another way of showing uh, how nanotubes can be functionalized, uh, in this case uh, by attaching molecules at defect sites, in this case by covalently bonding other molecules to the sidewall. So by uh, having a chemistry which would attack particular uh, perfect lattice sites and then attach these uh, multi-ring molecules like so. Uh, this is meant to imply non-covalent functionalization, so just physical association by electrostatics or by van der Waals forces of a molecule in solution to the surface of the nanotube, for example, a polymer or the SDS type molecule that we saw before. Uh, more complex uh, things can happen. Uh, actually, if you have long molecules, uh, in some cases they will actually wrap the nanotube if they want to associate themselves with the surface. There's indeed been a lot of work with carbon nanotubes and other structures in understanding the interactions of DNA with carbon nanotubes because the chemical, I mean chemical link scales are all the same, but because the helical pitch of DNA being uh, about a couple nanometers is in proximity to the uh, size of carbon nanotubes, and so strands of DNA can actually wrap themselves around nanotubes, and it's been shown that the association of particular DNA sequences with nanotubes depends on the sequence and the electronic structure of the nanotube. So one technique which was really interesting, although not very scalable because DNA is expensive, showed that you can choose certain DNA sequences that associate themselves with certain carbon nanotube chiralities and then use DNA separation techniques to separate out different DNAs that are bonded to carbon nanotubes, or that are associated, I should say, with carbon nanotubes because of the electronic interactions between the DNA and the nanotubes. And you can also do uh, other things like 
pack nanotubes with fullerenes or C60 molecules by inserting them in the open ends. And these are structures that have been made that are called peapods. <clears throat> so I'll just, you know, flash over these slides. Uh, just as, a, as an example, there are a lot of chemistries that are used to functionalize nanotubes in different ways. And if we take the idea that smaller diameter tubes are less energetically stable, we saw you know, back that that uh, qualitatively related to mechanical properties because there's more strain energy that wants to break up the lattice. The same thing is true in general if you take uh, identical nanotubes and decrease their diameter, it's easier to do chemistry on things that are less stable uh, as well. <clears throat> and we can also consider this idea of functionalization as a platform where you may use one type of interaction to uh, say physically or non-covalently associate a molecule with a nanostructure and you may use another molecule or a functional group to then bond on to something else. Uh, and if, for example, chemically bonding to the structure, such as the nanotube, would create defects and degrade its properties, you may, for example, use this physical association uh, to attach to the nanotube, and you may then use a chemical association from the other end of this stack to, for example, covalently bond to a polymer. And this, again, is a general platform with a lot of specific chemistries, which we won't get into, but this approach, in fact, was developed and patented by Zyvex and has been used to effectively disperse nanotubes in polymers for composites, uh, albeit at low volume fractions. This only works for, say, 3 or 4 percent carbon nanotubes in polymer or less, but uh, they patented this. Uh, chemistry and sold it to companies that uh, were interested in adding carbon nanotubes to polymers, uh, particularly to epoxy resins used in uh, uh, carbon fiber polymer composites. And uh, there are some aluminum, uh, uh, aluminum baseball bats and uh, you know, bike handlebars and hockey sticks and golf shafts and other things that contain these uh, CNT composites. Incidentally, it's a bit of marketing, but also some practical increases in performance, such as the a vibration damping of the baseball bats is a lot better, and the flexibility of the golf shaft is a lot better. And I heard uh, a, a, a few years ago that the company that had commercialized the golf shafts, Aldila, had sold something like 300,000 golf shafts uh, uh, in, in a single year. So apparently it's a pretty uh, popular product with some performance uh, advance. But to create this, the nanotubes were grown in a powder method, and then they were dispersed in solution. Uh, likely using sonication, and then this idea of uh, chemically functionalizing the surface and mixing with a polymer was used to create a uniform dispersion. And for things like mechanical properties of these materials, having a uniform distribution of nanotubes in the polymer and having good interaction between the nanotubes in the polymer is especially important for transferring the mechanical properties. And by way of uh, just graphic, uh, these approaches to functionalization extend also to materials such as quantum dots uh, and uh, in, in, in you know, some cases uh, or to other types of nanoparticles you know, such as gold nanoparticles and particularly in the examples we saw before of uh, nanoparticles being used for imaging or for aspects of cancer therapy or emerging cancer therapy such as using uh, plasmon resonance heating to uh, create hyperthermia to uh, perhaps kill tumor cells by, by heat. Uh, understanding how to bond chemicals to the surfaces of the molecules is important for, for example, targeting them to specific biomolecules. Uh, having, for example, an antibody that is eventually attached to the surface of your nanoparticle or having a sequence of DNA that's attached to it and then letting that go into the body and find its way to a particular site. And that is necessary, for example, for using uh, quantum dots as imaging agents if you wanted them to associate themselves with a certain type of tissue and look, for example, at that tissue. Or associate themselves with a tumor and have a very high resolution imaging technique that could expose that uh, you know, tumor and glow brightly as we know that quantum dots do. So there's certainly a whole lot of research in these types of chemistries and association with biomolecules, and it's certainly a topic that you could find in this review, and you know, this is almost five years old, and certainly a lot of work uh, on that topic since. <clears throat> so the, the last uh, topic uh, 
uh, of today's review uh, is a couple of methods on uh, separation and sorting. And so now that we have a, a basic idea of how nanostructures can be dispersed and how they can be purified, uh, you know, whether we start with what comes out of the reactor or out of the vat or uh, have something now that has been post-processed, there is often a lot of interest or necessity to, uh, to uh, spread them out by size or by shape. And there are a number of methods that are used to do this. And these methods in general are not necessarily unique to nanostructures. Uh, for example, centrifugation has been used in, you know, in biology. It's used for, uh, for separating proteins and spinning blood and things like that. But understanding how to use centrifugation, for example, to separate nanostructures by size and shape has led to some practical processes, for example, for, a pure, for separating nanotubes by chirality, as we'll see later on. Another example of a separation technique is electrophoresis, uh, generally also pioneered for biology and particularly used to uh, separate and size DNA. Uh, and we'll see that later when we talk about external fields, because electrophoresis uses an electric field to uh, take advantage of a, of a size and a charge dependent mobility uh, of things of different size and of different charge. And then the third method is filtering, just passing uh, your material through a filter. And if we can create a filter that has pores or holes that are on the size of the nanostructures we want to separate, you can actually physically exclude structures of different sizes. And so we'll talk in the rest of today's lecture about the method of centrifugation and methods of filtering and size exclusion. And the overarching principle to me here is that we use these techniques to create and to amplify a difference in the mobility of structures in a fluid based on their size, shape, or charge. So we start out with some polydisperse uh, uh, ensemble, different sizes, for example. And then we use one of these methods to spread them out by size. And we'll see next uh, that there are also ways that you can, say, take advantage of their difference in size and maybe use that to amplify a difference in another property that then lets you separate them out more effectively. So the first topic is you know, centrifugation. And as I'm sure many are you, of you are aware, uh, centrifugation is this general process of you know, just like spinning up your laundry, except spinning it in a little washing machine that goes at like tens of thousands of RPM. Uh, and uh, inside a centrifuge, which is a very typical laboratory instrument, kind of looks like that, you have a spinning carriage. And in that spinning carriage, uh, which sits on this, this rotor, uh, you typically put a tube containing the solution you want to work with. And you can have different types of tubes and different angles of the tube and so on. Uh, but you know it spins the tube at a high speed. And by the centrifugal force uh, that is exerted as the, as the fluid is spinned, you end up with a separation of things that are heavier or denser, uh, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, down the length of the tube. And if you can then execute this separation, you could, for example, pick up all the structures that have ended up down here at the bottom of the tube. Or if you're able to spread them out by size along the tube, you can take this tube out and you can stick in a pipette and you can say pick out ones from here and put them in beaker A, or pick out from here and put them in beaker B, and so on. And there are a lot of different methods that use this basic principle to achieve different types of separation. So in, in the world of, of centrifugation, there are two types of, uh, two, two categories that I want to talk about. And the first, and, and they, they differ based on the density of the solution that you use. So you have your structures, and they're in a solution. And in the first type of centrifugation, it's called differential centrifugation, you have your structures in a solution with a uniform density, like just a regular solution where it's sitting in this tube, and uh, the density of the, of the solution is the same all the way through the test tube. So that may not seem abnormal at all, but it's because the next type we're going to talk about actually uses a density gradient, so has lower density solution at the top than at the bottom. So in this first case, if you have uh, you know, a suspension of structures of, for example, particles of different size, and you put it in the centrifuge and you spin it up, uh, if it's being spun in a solution of a particular density, uh, then if you have structures that are larger or uh, denser than the solution, they are going to move faster toward the bottom of the tube. 
And by understanding this, the mobility based on size and based on time, you can then, for example, pick out, but, you know, spin it, stop it, and you can pick out stuff at the bottom and maybe take out the larger structures. And then you could maybe wash it if you wanted to, or just put it back in and spin it a bit more. And now that the larger structures are, you've taken a lot of them away, then say the next size down is going to come to the bottom of the tube, and you can pick that next size out, and so on. So by this general process, it's perhaps the simplest way that you can take advantage of a kind of a size-dependent mobility or a density-dependent mobility to separate structures by size. And the, you know, the rates and so on depend on a lot of things, but the process in general, if tuned correctly, can work quite well. <clears throat> the next type of centrifugation is this idea of doing the same kind of thing, uh, but having a gradient of densities of solution inside the tube. And so what's done here, for example, is one can buy different uh, centrifugation solutions uh, that, are, that are designed for this technique, where you can, for example, have a test tube and you know, uh, give a small amount of a higher density and a slightly lower density, and lower density, and lower density, and so on. Uh, and you know, if you don't shake it up, these are going to be uh, generally metastable, because they're, you know, the lighter ones are going to be on top of the heavier ones. So there are two general types of density gradient centrifugation, and uh, one is called uh, rate zonal separation, which, which helps you separate based on size and on mass. And there is one called isopycnic or pycnic separation, which helps you, sep you separate things based on density. And I want to focus on the right side, because that relates exactly to the example of carbon nanotube separation we're going to see on the next slide. And in this case, for example, you have this solution on the left with a gradient of different densities, top to bottom. And say you fill that solution, whether you put the stuff at the top to start or whether you're able to get it all in the solution, and you spin it up in the centrifuge. And then after a certain amount of time, by equilibrium, you're going to end up having structures uh, separated by density where, in general, the density of structures in a particular band is going to match the density of the solution, because the centrifugal force difference is going to depend on the difference between the density of the structure and the surrounding medium. So if you know, uh, the structure here is 1.1 grams per millimeter, mill milliliter, if, no matter how fast you spin it up, it's not going to move down, move to the outside faster than its solution environment. And so this is a stable way to separate out structures by different densities. And uh, uh, three or four years ago, there was a really uh, excellent and elegant uh, uh, application of this technique to separating uh, carbon nanotubes. So the you know, inherent problem that we keep uh, mentioning is that nanotube growth produces a polydisperse ensemble of chiralities. And how could you separate carbon nanotubes by chirality? Particularly uh, thinking that uh, if you remember the periodic table of nanotubes with all these different chiralities, you sometimes have size differences less than a tenth of a nanometer, uh, meaning uh, a me metallic or semiconducting. So you probably can't uh, filter them, for example, or, or use other size-dependent separation techniques. And what this group, uh, Mark Hersam's group at Northwestern, did is they found that uh, based on the uh, the size and electronic structure, whether nanotubes are semiconducting or metallic, uh, they associate themselves differently with certain surfactants. And this is kind of a complex process, but the bottom line is that based on diameter and chirality, nanotubes associate with particular surfactants in a way that creates a density difference. In other words, smaller nanotubes uh, associate with surfactants in a different way than larger nanotubes, perhaps larger ones having more space for surfactants. And also, metallic nanotubes associate with a different way uh, than semiconducting nanotubes, such that by understanding and optimization of this process, you can, you can turn differences in nanotube diameter and chirality into a magnified difference in density. And then you can use density gradient centrifugation to achieve separation of nanotubes by size and also by electronic structure. And so this is kind of their poster picture from the paper uh, where they used density gradient ultra centrifugation, like 12 hours spinning in the centrifuge at 50,000 RPM, to separate nanotubes out 
such that the smaller ones ended up at the top of the tube and the larger ones you know, ended up farther down and things like bundles which were clumps of smaller diameter tubes and therefore more dense uh, because the density of the nanotubes is bigger than the density of the surfactant ended up farther down and just you know based on uh, on, on the effect that the fact that the size of nanotubes that are semiconducting depends on their or the band gap depends on their size we see the quantum dot thing happen again we see color depending on the size of the structures and is kind of a qualitative indication of effective separation and they go through all the analysis of the optical spectra and so on but it was really an excellent way uh, that they uh, produced nanotube separations and in fact what they did is they uh, they chose to demonstrate this technique using commercially grown nanotubes by uh, this COMOCAT process or having a catalyst made out of cobalt and molybdenum uh, that we saw very briefly earlier uh, and they used these types of nanotubes because they were the most monodispersed nanotubes available on the market so in fact by making these catalyst particles in this catalyst system uh, which was invented at the University of Oklahoma uh, to create very narrow nanotubes in a very narrow size distribution this starting material already had uh, a particularly small distribution of chiralities there was like a majority of two or three different chiralities six five and seven five and also some eight threes and eight fours and this starting material was interesting because it consisted of a small number of chiralities uh, but it also had all those chiralities within a very narrow size range. So, you know, 6.5 and 7.5 are essentially one atom different along their diameter. So this t demonstration with this technique showed that they could really use this differential absorption to amplify the density gradient to spread out these nanotubes that were very, very identical in a lot of other cases. And uh, so uh, kind of similar to what we saw the, the plots a couple slides ago, they also quantify this separation by, by photoluminescence. So semiconductors are photoluminescent because they have a band gap and when you hit them with light they will then emit light that depends on their band gap and these pictures, again, you know, specific details being unimportant, you can see that the starting material has a lot of, of peaks and this is kind of a map that's used to understand the distribution of band gaps in a material and by these separation uh, processes and repeated steps they were able to take this picture and convert it to this picture where you see only one contribution and, and by by having pro a process under different conditions or by taking apart the two parts of the test tube at the end taking solution from two levels they were able to produce the other chirality so they're able to take these 6.5 nanotubes and separate them out and these 7.5 nanotubes and separate them out and you can kind of you know add this these this picture and this picture and get closer to the initial starting material so if you sorry if you go back to our periodic table of nanotubes you see that the 6.5 and 7.5 are right next to each other and their difference in diameter is uh, 1 minus 0.978 so 0 0.022 nanometers that's you know, point, uh, two angstroms, so it's very, uh, very small. And uh, this was an effective amplification and separation technique because of this, this association between the surfactants and the nanotubes. And if you, uh, when you read the paper, you'll see they did also uh, a lot more sophisticated things to make this happen. They understood also that if you had two different surfactants in the solution, there was kind of this competition between the surfactants and sticking to the particular nanotubes. And some types of nanotubes uh, would absorb more of one surfactant and some would absorb more of the other surfactant. And the surfactants had different densities and therefore that kind of helped things out. Uh, other things that were important were controlling the uh, presence of another buffer in the solution and also controlling the pH of the solution. But it all goes toward amplifying the gradient in density that is exposed by this technique, by this technique of separation. And you might ask, for example, how scalable is this? Well, centrifuges are used a lot in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, so you can make fairly large centrifuges, but it is quite expensive because it takes a lot of chemicals and a lot of time. But for the quantities of nanotubes that are uh, useful for electronics, you don't need much, but if it's highly pure, you can create a very good film. It's perhaps a commercially viable technique. And I think there's actually a small startup company that's selling uh, 
nanotubes purified by this process where they start with the Comocal, Comocat tubes from uh, Southwest Nan Nanotechnologies and they do this process and you can buy, for example, a vial of highly pure monochiral nanotubes with these particular chiralities. And that's also leading to some real advances in the science of the nanotubes because the ability to understand their optical properties and the electronic properties has been hampered by the unavailability of samples consisting of one chirality. So before, uh, if you wanted to study these properties, you had to deal with all the chiralities interacting with each other. And now if you can buy just one chirality, a lot purer information is available on the property side. And incidentally, the same group uh, also recently published on using uh, centrifugation to separate graphene by the number of layers. And here they take uh, assemblies of graphene that have a large number of sheets. They sonicate them to associate them with a surfactant. And some end up with just one layer with surfactant. And others end up with two and three and four layers. And just by uh, manifesting this same type of density gradient, they show, they've shown that they can generally separate graphene by uh, a number of layers. And because the graphene is denser than the surfactant, uh, single layer uh, assemblies that have surfactant around them uh, are, are less dense than multi-layer assemblies. So here, you know, electronically, uh, perhaps the graphene is always the same, but you have more surfactant relative to the amount of graphene as you have a smaller number of layers. And by manifesting that in a density gradient, you end up spreading out the material uh, in this test tube. And this technique was effective for that as well. So now if you took out, for example, the monolayer graphene, you could disperse it on a substrate and make some electronic devices and study its electrical properties. And in a similar fashion, this idea of mobility of nanostructures in solution has also been used to separate structures by shape. And the, in this case, uh, we're not uh, really talking about a, a difference in density because both these structures are all made from gold. But what's at work here is a difference in the mobility, the hydrodynamic mobility of different shapes in solution. And you could think of just this being like, say, a, a sphere having a different drag coefficient than a rod. And you know, the physics of slow flows and small scale are a bit different. But in principle, uh, by, this, uh, by this process, uh, they end up collecting the uh, you know, long shapes, the, uh, the rods, which have lower mobility on the sidewall of the tube. And they collect the uh, mixture largely containing uh, other shapes, the spheres and the, and the, and the, and the, and the squares, or you know, the more uh, rectangular shapes at the bottom of the tube. And the paper, which is in the references section, goes through the, uh, uh, the hydrodynamics of the process, how they achieve the separation. So this technique could also be used, for example, for shape. <clears throat> so uh, the last uh, topic we just have a few minutes for, and, and this will be a rush, but I, I think we'll get the general idea, and that'll be enough for us, is the use of membranes to filter nanostructures. So likewise, if you create a membrane with pores of small size, it's also possible, and it's been shown that you can separate structures by size. So you know, general membranes are used in a lot of areas, and you can use them to separate things based on size and based on charge, and they're used in applications from water treatment uh, to biology to, in this case, separation of nanostructures. And beneath this, I saw there's a band called the membranes, which I looked up. Uh, I don't know if they actually used any membranes, maybe in drum heads, but, uh, but we'll talk about the other membranes. So, uh, so you know, membranes are used in a lot of areas. It's like purifying blood by dialysis is a membrane process. Fuel cells use membranes to have selective transport of protons. And here, in this case, a polymer called you know, naphion is used, and that is, has, has very good selectivity to transport Trans, uh, transporting proteins because of its chemical characteristics and also because of its physical structure. And you know, within the body, uh, you know, there's a lot of transport across the cell membrane. And in like you know, nanotech in general, uh, there's a lot of work in trying to engineer artificial membranes to mimic the things like ion selectivity and protein selectivity that happen in the body. But when we work with membranes in the lab, you typically buy a filter that's you know, something that looks like this. It may be a centimeter or bigger in diameter, and it might be pretty thin and flexible, and you'll handle it with tweezers. And you'd put it in some apparatus that would let you flow the solution through it uh, to execute some separation. And this 
plot uh, just shows kind of the regimes of filtration at which membranes are used and um, uh, I mean to convey here that you can buy membranes of a wide range of pore sizes and, uh, and things like separating salt from water, desalination, or separating gases, or taking things like metal impurities out of water are already in the nanoscale size regime and that has in the basic case led to commercial av availability of a lot of materials with nanoscale pores that can be used to separate nanostructures. And uh, one particularly interesting and useful example of uh, nanoscale uh, membranes uh, is the process of uh, anodizing aluminum to form these anodic alumina membranes. Typically, this, uh, 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 this is called an AAO membrane by acronym. And what is done here is uh, you take bulk aluminum and uh, you apply a voltage to it uh, to anodize it in a chemical solution which oxidizes the aluminum. And because of the electrochemical process that goes on, you actually oxidize the surface of the aluminum and etch it to form pores, which because of the chemistry and the electric field and the process can be fairly small and also fairly straight. And by understanding this anodization process, uh, it's been commercially developed uh, to produce uh, these AAO uh, uh, nanoporous aluminum membranes that have fairly small pore sizes. And from this company, uh, Wattman, which I think is now owned by GE, you can buy uh, an aluminum membranes that have 200 nanometer pores, 100 nanometer pores, and 20 nanometer pores, and probably other sizes. And on the research side, there's also been work, for example, to use lithography to a template or to specify the location at which a pore starts forming in the material. So here, uh, this is pretty much a random process, you know, where the electric field and the chemistry locally decides where the pore forms, uh, and then they form like this. But if you, for example, uh, physically pattern the substrate so it had a whole bunch of little grooves that would concentrate the electric field uh, when you applied the voltage in solution, then it's been shown to be possible to achieve a fairly uh, good control over the pore size and the pore density. And in this case, they were working with pores in the tens to hundreds of nanometer range. And although this is more complex, it's an improvement upon the order that can be achieved here. And just a couple examples in the past couple minutes. Uh, it's been shown, in fact, several years ago that uh, you can use membranes to separate nanoparticles by size. So you might say that, like, you know, nanotubes are more tangled and longer. So, you know, really for long, narrow things, it might be harder to, to, to fish them through a membrane. But for something like a nanoparticle, which is, you know, a well-confined sp spherical body, it's a lot easier to, uh, to filter them or to fraction them by membrane filtration. So here's a case where they started out, I think, uh, with gold nanoparticles that were dispersed in toluene and by passing the nanoparticles through a polymer membrane that had a very small pore size of only a few nanometers because of this principle of size exclusion the big ones can't fit through but the smaller ones can fit through they were able to reduce and narrow the size distribution of the particles beneath uh, this border of between three and four nanometers. <coughs> and another type of filter that's been shown uh, as uh, you know, there's been a lot of filters made, uh, is the idea of using a, a forest of carbon nanotubes as a filter. And you know, we saw before in the flow lecture that uh, you can flow through carbon nanotubes, and there was some uh, data in those uh, papers on gas separation and also liquid separation. Uh, and this idea of size selection through nanotubes can also be at work. Uh, but what I'm showing here is kind of a different approach where they actually used a forest of nanotubes as you could imagine uh, uh, like, a, like a spring, uh, like, a, like an elastic layer of springs, uh, where in this apparatus, if they uh, compressed the nanotube forest, they changed the flow resistance of the membrane, and they were able to modulate its uh, fluidic resistance. And so here is a case where the nanotubes are well aligned, and here is a case where they're compressed. And you can see the two cases shown in the SCM here. And if you see the plot on the left, they've plotted the flux versus pressure drop. So it's behaving actually in a, in a, in a linear pressure drop fashion, as we'd, we would expect for incompressible flow of a liquid. But as you compress the membrane, you increase its flow resistance and therefore decrease the flux. 
So it could be said that you're decreasing the effective pore size of the material by compressing the space among the nanostructures. And you know, further data in this paper, they actually used it to show separation and size exclusion of proteins, proteins having different molecular weights and different effective sizes, and showed that if the membrane was really squashed down to be very thin, they were able to separate proteins, uh, uh, they were able to exclude proteins of larger sizes. And uh, to close, this is the last slide, I just want to emphasize that you know, often you need a lot of different methods to achieve a desired final result. So you know, taking the example of nanotube separation using centrifugation, that required dispersion of the nanotubes, isolation of them with a surfactant, and then the separation by a density gradient to achieve that very small sample of desired uh, chirality. So that's a very high value product, but it's one that took a lot of effort, and in fact, in most synthesis of nanostructures, you might buy you know, quantum dots or buy nanotubes. It's often the case that the cost of the purification and separation procedures, if necessary, are more than the cost of the synthesis process, which is why things like starting with a nanotube powder and annealing it in the big furnace uh, to improve its quality and remove the amorphous carbon and remove the iron has been very effective and also has enabled large-scale production of nanotubes for, uh, you know, for the 300 tons a year application. If that cost way more than the synthesis, there's no way that that would be economically feasible. Okay, so that's it.